We have twin big flare players firing multiple big solar flares, a near-Earth directed solar storm, and we have some fast solar wind on the way. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Our sun gets busy this week as we take a look at our Earth-facing disk. Look down in the south. We've got two big flare players that are continuing to develop. In fact, they're kind of like twinsies. We've got region 3088 in the west and 3089 in the east. And these two regions are firing near simultaneously. It's, it's actually an interesting spectacle. Region 3088 is actually the one that's been firing off a lot of solar storms. And one of them is partly Earth-directed, just a skosh. We'll talk more about that in a minute. It. Meanwhile, the region 3089 is the biggest of the flare players. This region launched uh, an M, almost an M6 flare, so we've gotten R2 level radio blackouts from this region. But meanwhile, both of them continue to fire. But those, believe it or not, that's not the only story. We also have region 3086 that you can see has been developing and pushing through this big coronal hole. That means that the fast solar wind we're going to get from this coronal hole, which should be hitting us in and around the 29th, will be a bit demanding diminished because it's actually kind of closing that coronal hole up as it continues to emerge. Nonetheless, we should still get some disturbances starting around the 29th. And on top of that, we do have other regions that are actually launching solar storms and are a bit flare active, so we're going to have to pay close attention. So Aurora photographers, there may be more on the way. You need to get ready. And just when we think we're getting a reprieve, region 3088 fires off its largest M-class flare yet. It also launches a fast solar storm that's moving what looks to be west of Earth. And now we find ourselves in a solar radiation storm. We've reached the S1 level and it's going to likely continue to storm this way until that solar storm reaches Earth and passes by Earth and then things will kind of calm down. But it goes to show that we just can't look away from these regions even for a moment. Switching to our M-flare threat meter, as we take a look at our X-ray flux, you can see that throughout the week we've been pretty much hovering below the seafloor. That is until about midday on the 24th. You can watch that X-ray flux rise. In fact, it even pierces right through that seafloor. And just a few hours later, we start popping those M-class flares. This is because of region 3088 and 3089 as they're emerging on the Earth-facing disk and really letting loose. In fact, over the past 24 hours or so, you can tell we We've actually popped at least six M-class flares. And when you see that on the 26th, you see that big flare, that was the M6-class flare, and it actually lasted above radio blackout conditions for over three hours. So amateur radio operators, you are definitely feeling it on the day side. In fact, as we switch to our DRAP model, you can see the big flares lighting up the atmosphere in this model here. The big flare started hitting when day side was in the European uh, time zone, but as it began to move across the pond, you can actually see that radio blackout conditions really impacted um, amateur radio communications across the pond, especially at low frequencies. And that conditions, though those conditions are going to be the norm here over the next few days, possibly even beyond that, until regions 3088 and 3089 rotate off of the Earth-facing disk. Expect this to uh, continue, and R1 to R2 radio blackouts are definitely going to be on the menu. Now switching to our radiation storm threat meter, as we take a look early on the 27th, you can see those particle fluxes rise, and sure enough, we've peaked above the S1 threat level. Now the nice thing about this radiation storm is that it's what we call a soft spectrum, meaning it doesn't have the highest energy particles. So it's uh, going to be a mild radiation storm, but likely it's going to last over the next couple days. And as we take a look at the DRAP model, sure enough, you can see both at high latitudes in the north and in the south, you're getting that radiation storm impacting all uh, longitudes, so all times of the day, basically over the poles. And this causes issues for GPS navigation as well as radio communications. And sadly, these conditions will persist until that uh, solar storm passes by us sometime, we believe, on the 29th. 
Switching to our solar storm conditions, we can see the last time we actually hit storm levels was clear back on the 17th. This was due to the uh, series of solar storms from region 3078 that's kind of similar to 3088 to a great degree, but we're not going to get quite the level of storming now that we got with, the, uh, with this other series. We'd actually got to G2 levels back on the 17th, and because of the storms just kept coming, some of them missed us, but some of, us, some of them hit us. We actually stayed sporadically at storm levels almost until about the 20th when things began to kind of finally calm down and that's uh, and then then conditions went to kind of quiet conditions until once again we've now ramped back up and we've hit active conditions now and this is once again from another series of storms that are kind of sideswiping earth right now and likely the biggest one is going to hit us right around the 29th we're going to have to see about that so we could bump up to storm levels again it's not going to be nearly as uh, dramatic as the series that we just went through but it could give us some decent fun and along with some fast solar wind from that coronal hole it could keep us storming easily in through the early part of next week. Now switching to our solar storm prediction model Enlil, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the north pole and earth is off to the right. Now now, this version of the model will only have the solar storms that are going to be partly Earth-directed. So there are more solar storms than what you see launched here. But as you can watch, the first one is that slow solar storm that was launched on the 25th that looked like it had an Earthward component, and it is rapidly overtaken by that solar storm that was launched on the 27th. It was just recently. And as you can see, as those two kind of reach and, and, and smash into one another, it looks like the impact is going to be uh, late on the 28th early into the 29th, so it's very similar to what we had thought before this uh, faster solar storm was being launched. It's just going to intensify the impact a bit. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you're definitely going to get a show, and it looks like it's actually made the chances of getting a show even down at mid-latitudes a lot better than it would have been otherwise. So what else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well, this is Stereo A. It's our partially far-sighted monitor. You can see here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A staring at the sun just a tiny bit from the side. And when we take a look at Stereo A's picture, you can see region 3088 and 3089 kind of roiling and broiling on either side of that big coronal hole. And this is pretty much the same view we have from Earth. But if you look just on the east limb, you can see a few regions that are just outside of Earth's view. And it does look like there's a couple regions that are firing solar storms and may even be a little bit flare active that are going to be rotating into Stereo's view in just a few days. Also, you can also see on the east limb in the north, there's a dark area. That is a new coronal hole, or rather returning coronal hole. This is the coronal hole that gave us some fast solar wind about a month ago that ended up giving us some decent storming. And it looks like that coronal hole is going to return and could give us some more chances for Aurora in about uh, 10 days, maybe a little bit, I don't know, about a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. It's kind of hard to tell until that region rotates more into view. But it does mean for for Aurora photographers, it looks like we are going to get some more chances for Aurora, even if every solar storm misses us. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the new moon phase on our way to a first quarter, and by the first, the moon will still be only about 26% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, the moon is cooperating right now, so now's a great chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are beginning to feel the effects of the series of solar storms that have been kind of rapid fired from region 3088. In fact, we're going to be in feeling the effects and, and probably reaching the peak right around the 29th. At high latitudes, we are experiencing active conditions, but we do have a minor storm chance around the 29th and up to about a 60% chance of a major storm. And so aurora photographers, you could actually get some decent storming in and around now and possibly in through the early to mid part of next week. Now, at mid latitudes, it's not quite as strong. We are experiencing active conditions sporadically, but we do have up to about a 50% chance of a minor storm at mid latitudes, and this could be some substantial storming for a short while, but it's likely going to calm down by Tuesday. Definitely by the end of the month, things should be back to being pretty quiet. So, Aurora photographers, you do have a, a decent chance of getting some shots, things might be a bit sporadic, but it's definitely worth a look. 
Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we have twin active regions on the Earth-facing disk that both have the X factor. In fact, we've been getting R2 level radio blackouts from them. NOAA is giving us about a 55% chance of M-class flares over the next three days because of these regions. In fact, we even have about a 25% chance of X flares. So everybody who's dealing with amateur radio on Earth's day side or GPS reception, just just know radio blackouts are on the menu and will continue to be easily through this week. Luckily, we are also getting some decent solar flux. We're up in the triple digits, so that means good radio propagation on Earth's day side, even despite the noise that people are going to be hearing on the bands. Now get ready though, because these, even as region 3088 kind of rotates out of view, know that region 3089, as it begins to rotate into that area, that same longitude that caused that region 3088 to get excited and start firing flares. Even if region 3089 goes quiet for a bit, it could get loud again. So these conditions will easily continue over this week and possibly into next week until region 3089 also rotates out of view. Now also on top of that, we are in the process of dealing with an S1 radiation storm. We're at that S1 level right now. We may kind of hover above and below it over the next few days until that solar storm that was launched on the the 27th passes by Earth and then things will begin to go downward. So right around the 29th, things should start it, start really descending and getting quiet again. And again, this affects people at high latitudes. It also is something for you frequent flyers and you airline passengers. Just know that you're in that S1 radiation storm, so please take it into consideration in your flight plans, especially if you're flying at high latitudes and high altitudes or intercontinental flights. So the space weather this week is very exciting. We have twin big flare players on the Earth-facing disk that have the X factor. In fact, region 3088 has been firing off a series of solar storms, some of which uh, are Earth-directed, and we're already beginning to feel the effects of that. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you're already getting a decent show. If you're at mid-latitudes, well, shows are beginning to sporadically ramp up, and it looks like the peak is going to be right about the 29th when two big solar Solar storms end up kind of slamming into one another and just kind of sideswiping Earth. So aurora photographers, definitely keep your batteries charged. We could get a, a little, you know, bit of a show. It's even down at mid latitudes. Not sure how big it's going to be, but it could be something for you. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, radio blackouts, even at the R2 level, are on the menu right now, and they're going to continue to be. In fact, even as region 3088 rotates off of the sun's west limb, 3089 may quiet down a little bit for a short while, and then when it reaches where 3088 was on the near the west limb, it might pick up again. So we might get a little bit of a reprieve from the big flares, and then another kind of, you know, next chapter, right, before region 3089 completely rotates off the Earth-facing disk. So just be aware of that. We're going to be dealing with these uh, noisy conditions on the radio bands and radio blackouts for quite some time. And now you GPS users, well, you know, you're just going to have to hang in there for a little bit. We do have issues on the day side that causes, uh, you know, these radio blackouts can cause GPS reception, especially near dawn and dusk, to be really dicey. And then when we have the solar storms kind of ramping up, well, that doesn't help either because aurora is not something you want to have your, you know, have to deal with GPS reception through because it just doesn't do so well. So just hang in there for the next few days. And as we move into midweek uh, in the next week, things should definitely settle down. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.